This is quite the topic to cover. I want to thank Arg Science for suggesting the topic um, of martial arts um, to observe and which one I should um, suggest that a deductionist or detective use. This has actually turned out to be one of the most extensive research projects I've done in my life next to my deduction of art research project that I'm still constantly working on. And to be honest, I haven't actually finished this research project. I'm still studying martial arts on a daily basis, doing research and observing videos and breaking down fights and all kinds of things like that. Processes that I'll explain in this video. Um, but I believe I have gained a deep enough knowledge and understanding of various martial arts by this point that I can actually go ahead and start explaining uh, which martial arts I would suggest that a uh, detective or deductionist or any general person who just wants to protect themselves um, to give themselves an element of self-defense would study and how they should study it compared to how many other places would have you study. I'm going to open this video by, of course, mentioning that I am no martial arts expert. I've only done the research that I've concluded on this own on my own study, my own time. But I think that the information and the things that I want to share here will be of practical value to my viewers and to anyone else who stumbles across this video. Kailari Peatu. This is considered the world's oldest martial art, though not necessarily its first, though there is a strong contender. It appears that martial arts that are today common, like Krav Maga, Kung Fu, stemmed from this original martial art. But the fact of the matter is that there is evidence suggesting the existence of hundreds of martial arts forgotten over generations, their names lost in history. Much like Bartitsu, Bartitsu originally was only practiced for a handful of years before the dojo training the gentleman's self-defense form was closed down. It survives today simply by the obscure reference in the Sherlock Holmes books and by a group of historians who resurrected the otherwise dead martial arts. Unfortunately, there are many other martial arts that received no such resurrections. With that slight history lesson aside, the question stands. What makes a martial art practical for a deductionist to learn? Well, first of all, let's consider what qualifications a deductionist will consider when selecting their preferred martial art. Most likely, you're looking for a martial art that is primarily for self-defense. This means a few things. For one, since you won't be likely entering many competitions, you won't need one that demands constant devotion, training, attention, and discipline. Something more casual will suffice. Secondly, you should value practicality above all else. Flashy movements and combinations are unnecessary. While training combinations is useful, in real combat situations, strings of attacks rarely prove useful. So you're looking for substance, not to simply memorize a set of moves. Next, you want something that can be implemented at any time and without preparation. You never know when you might need to defend yourself, so learning a martial art that requires prior preparation or special tools is useless. You want something with utility where you can use your environment and natural tools to your advantage. While these are useful practices to learn, you won't always have a bow staff, bakken, or katana substitute on hand. So is there any one martial art style that fits these criteria? Yes and no. Take for example Kung Fu. There are many different forms of Kung Fu, and each one is suited to a different situation, physical prowess, or opponent. Additionally, masters of Kung Fu are known for utilizing both surroundings and tools that wouldn't necessarily be considered weapons unless in their own hands to their advantage. However, like any other martial art, Kung Fu has its flaws. For example, many places that teach Kung Fu may put a disproportionate amount of emphasis on using combinations or strings of attacks instead of individual blows. As discussed before, strings of moves can be useful, but typically all of that training can be lost in real combat scenarios. Look at another example, Bartitsu. 
Bartitsu was the gentleman of the French form in the Edwardian era, or at least that was the idea before the classes were disbanded. It was designed with the idea that your opponent will be more physically strong than you, a brute of those times, or that he would have more martial training than you. So it wasn't concerned with necessarily outright defeating your opponent, rather it was designed to quickly subdue adversaries using leverage to render their attacks useless. He utilized everyday items like hats, canes, umbrellas, and even a bicycle. However, it too has its flaws. For one, even when it was being developed, it only had limited application. Additionally, it is essentially a dead martial art, meaning that we only have limited information about how the martial art was used. So how do we decide on a martial art? My suggestion is not to rely on any one martial art. Study various forms and combat styles. Understand the philosophies and principles, not every move and drill. Exercise what you've learned, because all that head knowledge in the real world will do you no good in a combat situation. This sounds a bit like mis mixed martial arts, but mixed martial arts isn't quite disciplined enough for what I'm trying to accomplish. Many people view mixed martial arts as a fast way to train in skills they want, while ignoring the more mundane facets of the same philosophies. I'm suggesting that you find styles that appeal to you and study those. Study the philosophies, because those are important, sometimes even more important than the actual combat. If you're looking for a good foundation to start your own training, don't go to a martial arts dojo like you see in so many towns and cities. Oftentimes these things are embellished or kept simple and safe. There's no real challenge or threat, everything's choreographed. You don't want to practice choreographed drills because that is just memorization. Practice unplanned fights with comrades. Go to your local police department. Oftentimes the police force offers self-defense courses that are typically more practical than an academy and doesn't require you to dedicate yourself to a single fighting style or discipline. It can be a great place to start a knowledge base and grow from there. Unfortunately, not all police departments offer such courses, but I'm sure you can find one in a reasonable proximity to yourself that interests you. Study from books and any resources you have at your disposal. Watch martial art matches and analyze the fights. Take note of who wins and who loses and why, what style each opponent was using. It helps to watch the fights that have fighters using martial arts that you are studying at the time. As for styles like Kendo or Bujitsu, don't necessarily ignore these. They can be great ways to train adaptability. Like I mentioned, you obviously won't always have a Bakken or bow staff substitute on hand, but they can be a great advantage when you do. Additionally, every fighting style has a dedicated philosophy. Krav Maga, for example, isn't concerned with the health of your attacker, and so it doesn't hinder you from landing lethal blows. It even teaches single strike death blows. Compare this with Kaiyu Shoujitsu, which focuses instead on landing disabling blows, targeting pressure and nerve points. Both of the above styles require the practitioner to be knowledgeable about anatomy, which can also be important when selecting a martial art. Consider what other things the style would demand you learn. The styles I have trained in so far are as follows. Kendo and several subforms of Kendo, Bojitsu, Fencing, Single Stick, Boxing, Kaiyusho Jitsu, Bartitsu, and Wing Chun. This isn't a list of styles that I suggest you look into. I'm also not a master in any of these forms except maybe some Kendo subforms, but they may be styles that interest those who have a similar mindset as myself. Now I would like to address the elephant in the room, the Sherlock Holmes fight scenes. Where do deduction and martial art meet? Plainly, you will never be able to do what Sherlock Holmes is capable of doing in those movies. The ability to analyze a fight that hasn't even happened yet to that level is simply impossible. With that being said, deduction can give a fighter a clear edge in combat. For example, I can often identify my opponent's combat style before they've begun an attack. Granted, I do know the people I train with very well at this point, but I've even done this with strangers. Another advantage might be in deducing the handedness of your adversary. 
to understand what attacks they might lead with and what they might favor. Also, as many combat masters will tell you, combat often can boil down to exploiting your opponent's weaknesses and blind spots. Imagine how quickly a deductionist might be able to observe the weaknesses of a combatant, be it a limp, a bad shoulder, or any other number of flaws. Lastly, I will defer to BBC's Sherlock. Now this version of Sherlock Holmes is no action hero, like the Robert Downey Jr. version. However, we do see him kind of enter combat on a few occasions. I'm referring to Series 2, Episode 1, Scandal in Belgravia. The American agent threatens Mrs. Hudson, and Sherlock, in an instant, sizes up the man and begins ticking off attack points. While this isn't necessarily an element of deduction alone, a study in anatomy can, obviously, be of great aid to any combatant. So even combat has room for deduction to be applied to it.